Amen. Praise God. Well, if you've been coming uh, for any length of time here, you know that we've been in the middle of a series called From the Beginning. And I, uh, for those of you who've been here, you've heard me say this many times in many various ways, but it's basically the same idea that Jesus very specifically pointed his followers and those that weren't his followers, people that were just on the receiving end of his ministry, he pointed everyone back to a place where God in the beginning had something in mind. And men have done all that they can to adapt and make things their way, but Jesus says, no, no, God had something different in mind. He said, from the beginning, it looked like this. And so we've been taking week upon week here, 16 weeks today, 16 weeks of talking about how things were in the beginning, simply trying to listen to the Holy Spirit and highlight areas of life that God wants our lives to look like, what he had in mind, the blueprint from the beginning. So today I want to speak on another element of how things were in the beginning because that is what we're all supposed to be heading toward and striving for in our lives. I'd like to talk today about that in the beginning, man, both male and female, mankind, was covered with the glory of God. Now, physically, the Bible says they were naked, but they didn't know it because they were covered. They had no idea what nakedness even was because they were covered, not with an outward covering, but with the glory of God upon their lives. In the day that they sinned, that they, they fell into sin, they bought the lie from the devil, suddenly they became uncovered and they were aware of their condition, which was no longer secure, it was no longer safe, it was vulnerable, it was fi filled with shame, and so on. So from the beginning, God was the covering of mankind, everything they would ever need. And you know this term that they were naked, let me just read to you Genesis 3, 7, it says, and the eyes of them, speaking of Adam and Eve, were both opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. They basically tried to cover themselves and be, you know, for themselves protection. When God wanted to be their protection, now they are left to themselves to do their own thing. And I think it's better to think of this term to be naked as to be uncovered. That's really what we're talking about today. What it means to be uncovered. Covering is more than clothing. Covering is spiritual in nature. Covering has to do with protection. It has to do with a lot of other things. So when God saw their condition, that they now were uncovered by a choice they made, he provided a covering for them in the garden. Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, it says, And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins, and he clothed them. Now, this is really the first picture of what it was going to take to cover mankind again, and it required the shedding of blood. The animal skin, we understand you don't just find a skin. You kill an animal, get a skin. And it was the first idea God was introducing to mankind. For you to be adequately covered, blood must be shed, which tells us very clearly that God was beginning to paint a picture that we in time would come to understand that the blood of his son on a cross would be the remedy for mankind's uncoveredness and he would once again be covered. There is no covering, adequate covering, but the blood of Jesus Christ. When you think of God seeing his man and the woman there uncovered, it would be like a father's heart for a child who would be naked, let's say, in wintertime in some cold and frigid environment with pity in his heart. Just like if your child was in some Siberian you know, wilderness in the midst of winter and they were naked, you would want to do everything you could to somehow clothe them. And even though Adam and Eve were in sin, God was not mad at them. God loved and pitied them and so wanted to cover them. And that is still today the burning heart of God. Though the world has gone astray and man is living in all kinds of base things, God's hands are still outstretched, wanting to provide a covering because he loves people. That is the heart of God. 
Nothing but the blood of Jesus can do that. I tell you, men try all kinds of ways to cover themselves, to protect themselves, to somehow make up that sense of safety and, and clothing, if you will. But nothing but the precious blood of Jesus Christ can fulfill that spot in our lives. This theme of God having pity upon people and over even nations at large is not an isolated theme. It's throughout the Scripture. The book of Ezekiel, chapter 16, is God's pitiful heart toward Jerusalem and His feeling of pity for Jerusalem in her condition. He, I won't take time to read it all today, but you can read it on your own. But in chapter 16, God is saying to Israel and to Jerusalem, in the day that you were born, you came from a heathen background. You were heathens. You were totally out there in wild, crazy stuff. And in the day that you were born, there was no one there to swaddle you. There was no one there to take care of you as an infant. But I, the Lord, came on the scene for you. In verse 6 of chapter 16, God says, And when I passed by you, and I saw you wallowing in your blood, I said to you, in your blood, live. And I said to you, in your blood, live. He repeats himself. I made you flourish like a plant. And, I, and you grew up and became tall and arrived full, in full adornment. He's saying to Jerusalem, I came in, I intervened, I blessed you, and you began to prosper. And as you did, here's what he says, when I passed by you again, I saw you, behold, you were at the age of love, and I spread the corner of my garment over you, and I covered your nakedness. Here we have it again, God's burning heart to be the covering of a people. And he's saying to Jerusalem, in your condition, even though you're prosperous, you still need to be covered. I tell you as a nation, it's one thing to be a prosperous nation monetarily. It's another thing to be prosperous and to be covered by a loving God. There is a difference. And God's heart is looking for a people to whom he can cover. It goes on to say, this is very important, I covered your nakedness. I made my vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord God, and you became mine. Now this idea of spreading the garment over someone would be like a husband spreading his cloak over his wife. Symbolically, this was a custom in Israel. It was a way of showing, I am now your covering. I'm your provider. I'm your protector. I'm your shield. I am your covering. And God is saying to Israel and to Jerusalem specifically, the day that I covered you, I made a covenant with you. I entered into a covenant and you became mine. You see, many times we want to be covered because we want the benefits of being covered. And it's beautiful. It's wonderful. But being married just to get out of your crisis is not what God's after. God wants us to be his and his, him to be ours. He wants a marriage relationship with a people. A love relationship where you actually want to be with him and he wants to be with you. It's a beautiful thing. And I tell you, many, much of Christianity today has been formed around come to God and he'll meet your needs. And that's true. He's a covering for us in Christ. But there's so much more than just having protection. God wants us to be his lover and us to love him fully. And he deserves it. And let me tell you, there's no one more worthy of that kind of love than God himself. He's a merciful God. He's a good God. He's a beautiful God. He's a friend to sin sinners and publicans. He's a beautiful Savior. That's why multitudes flocked to see him. Not the religious folks. They were the harlots, the tax collectors, the alcoholics, the outcast of society. When they saw Jesus... And they smelled the fragrance of Jesus Christ. They were drawn in love to him. And God once again is reaching out to whosoever will for this kind of love. Someone who would love us at our worst. That's why he says in Ezekiel, when I saw you in your blood, it was the time of love and I said to you, live. God's wanting to awaken love in a people. He wants to be our husband. This idea carries out in the book of Ruth. You know the story? There's a Moabite widow She's a Moabite. That means she's not a part of Israel. She has no claim to any promise from God at all. She's what the scripture would just call he, heathen, pagan, whatever, outcast. And because an Israelite woman, Naomi, is living there for a season, both of their husbands die. 
and Ruth returns with Naomi back to Israel, and they're two widows, they're barren and they're destitute, and their future is looking pretty bleak. They went out rich. The Bible says Naomi came, went out rich but came home poor. No longer call me Naomi, call me Mara, call me bitter. She was bitter in spirit at that time. And in that place, Naomi sends Ruth, this Moabite nobody, out into the field to garner, to, to garner from the, the droppings of the harvesters, those, those who were harvesting. And she's out there and she meets this guy, Boaz. And when she tells her mother-in-law, Naomi, about Boaz, Naomi gets real excited and says, Oh my gosh, this guy has the ability to redeem our family because he's in the line and he has a legal right to actually take us in and make us his own. And so she tells Ruth, she says, Tonight, the men are going to be harvesting and uh, winnowing the wheat and so on, and they're going to be having a big celebration and a party. It's not legal for women to go there, but I want you to go there anyways, take a little risk, break a few of the rules, and I want you to hang out in the bushes. That's my paraphrased version, but I think that's what she was doing. Until they're done eating and drinking and making merry, and when the men lie down, mark the place where Boaz lies down, and go and lay down at his feet. And then she says these powerful words, and he will tell you what to do. So many people want to know what to do with their lives, but nobody's willing to take the risk to go to the place where he is and lay down at his feet. But I'm telling you, the answer to your destiny and your future is at the feet of the one, the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave it all for you and for me. So, Ruth does this, she obeys. I'm reading out of Ruth chapter 3, verse 8. And at midnight, the man, uh, she lays down at his feet, and it says, At midnight, the man was startled, and he turned over, and behold, a woman was laying at his feet. And he said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. And then she says these powerful words because she understood something. Spread your skirt or your garment over me, for you are a redeemer. Now, here's the idea. We're going back to the beginning. And in the beginning, God had covered man as a husband would cover a wife. And now we have this destitute woman. It is the condition of humanity, really, today at large, who's needing once again to be covered. But I believe the ball's in our court today. The ball's in our court because Adam and Eve chose and they came, became uncovered. We must now choose to be covered. I'll say that one more time. Adam and Eve made a choice, and that choice uncovered them. Today, it is now on us to make another choice, and that choice must be to be covered by God. And so Ruth takes the risk. She lays at the feet of the one who can redeem her, and I'm telling you that person to us is Jesus Christ. And at his feet, when he looks and sees her there, you know God's just waiting to see you and me in a certain place. It's amazing to me how we want God to come meet us where we are, and he does many times. But there comes a certain point in the relationship when God says, it's on you now to show up where you're supposed to be to demonstrate that you want what I'm offering you. I know people don't like to hear this, but it's a fact. It's now on us. What kind of meaningful relationship exists that's all one-sided? And we formed a branch of Christianity that's all one-sided. God, bless me, bless me, bless me. It's all about me, 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 me. And God says, at what point in this relationship do you start saying, God, here am I for you? At what point in the relationship? There must be a point when we grow up as sons and daughters and a bride-to-be. Otherwise, that relationship is so shallow and pathetic it has nothing to do with the original intent, which was a bride, which is a responsive woman to an initiative from a husband. And our husband has certainly done his part to show his love. He's done his part to show his love. He gave his very life. Now he wants to know, will we return? So Ruth does her part. And then when he says, what are you doing here? Her answer was the right one. Spread your skirt or the ESV version says, extend your wing over me, for you are a redeemer. You see, when we get to the place where we can say, God, I acknowledge that I'm uncovered 
and I need you to cover me again. I don't want to go through life uncovered. I want to be under not only the protection, but I want to be under the bridal calling you have for me as your bride. We have to show our interest. Let me just read a few verses here that highlight this burning heart of God to be our covering. Psalms 105, verse 37. Then he brought out Israel with silver and gold, and there was none among his tribes who stumbled. Egypt was glad when they departed, for the dread of them had fallen upon it. He, God, spread a cloud for a covering and fire to give light by night. You know, we hear about the Exodus story, Israel coming out of 400 years of Egyptian bondage, and God goes before them. And in the wilderness, it says here, he spread a cloud for a covering. Do you hear the word covering? And fire to give light by night. This is more than just God protecting a people from the heat of the day. This is a gesture of wanting to be their husband. I'm spreading my cloud over you. I'm putting my wing over you. This is love language according to the scripture. God's heart to be our husband. They asked and he brought quail. He gave them bread from heaven in abundance. He opened the rock and water gushed out. It flowed through the desert like a river. He remembered his promise to Abraham, his servant. He brought his people out with joy, his chosen with singing. He gave them the lands of the nations, and they took possession of the fruit of the people's toil, that they might keep his statutes and observe his laws. Praise the Lord. All of those signs, quail and water in the wilderness, these are all God's way of saying, as you're covering, I'm your provider. I'm your protector. I'm everything you need. Don't look somewhere else. You were in Egypt, and some wanted to return to the covering of Egypt because at least they thought they had protection and food there. But God is saying, there's no going back here for this people. Here's the challenge. I, God, will prove you. I want to be your covering. Do you trust me to be that for you? Isaiah 25, verse 4. For you have been a stronghold to the poor, a stronghold to the needy in his distress, a shelter from the storm and a shade from the heat. Verse 26, this is important now. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow and aged wine well-refined. Now listen. And he, God, will swallow up on this mountain, the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. Now, please just hang with me here. This is very important. Here, Isaiah gives us an insight that there's another covering that's trying to cover the earth and bring people under its arm. Unfortunately, this covering is a demonic covering. I reference two things, verse 6 and verse 7. Verse 6 says, on this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of rich things. You see, God wants to cover all people. It's his will that none should perish. This gospel is for the whole world, everyone. And yet, in verse 7, we're, we're told of a covering that's also cast over all people, is what it says. And God says, I'm going to destroy it on this very mountain. This mountain is a reference to a people who've returned to the Lord in worship and in adoration. The mountain of the Lord, Zion. God says, I want all people to be blessed and come under my wing. And the devil is saying, I want all people to trust in me. I want all people to give up their right to be under God, and I want them to come under me. If you do any scriptural studies, you realize that at the end of the age, the one sure tell sign that we're at the end of the age is the devil is building systems in which he wants to bring everyone, all people, underneath. One world banking system, one world health organization, one world, you name it, it's there. 
and it's forming in right in front of our eyes. And the idea is that if you come under the system, you will be protected, you will be provided, you will be cared for under the system. Revelation chapter 13 says that in that day, no man will be able to buy, sell, or trade except he comes under the system. I'm paraphrasing, but that's what it says. Read it for yourself. You see, there's two kingdoms that are saying, I want to be over you. One is a loving, merciful kingdom given by God himself, and it's a husband to a bride. The other one is a cloud of darkness, according to Isaiah. This covering is a dark cloud, and it's cast over all people and all nations. If there was ever a time we're getting a visual of this, it's right now. We look around the world today, and we see the whole world stretching and reaching for an answer to this supposed pandemic, whatever you may call it. But the whole world, all people, all people are having to deal with it. And this is the deal. At the end of the age, all people must deal with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 24, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached for a witness to the whole world, and then the end will come. All people are going to hear this gospel. This is not a time for us to draw back as believers. It is a time for us to step up onto the platform and the stage of history and bring the gospel to the nations. Hallelujah. God says, I will swallow up this on this mountain the covering that is cast over all people. That's a promise from God that the devil's work will not succeed in the end. God says, I'm going to swallow this thing up, this veil that is spread over all nations. And then it says in verse 28, Isaiah 25, 38, he will swallow up death forever. Here's the end game. And the Lord will wipe away tears from all faces and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken it. That's good news, isn't it? Come on, in the end, though there's a contest going on, God is going to have the final say, and death itself will have to yield up its prisoners. Glory to God. So it's clear the devil wants to be our covering. I know that's hard to think about, but I'm just telling you, he wants to be the one in whom we come up under and trust the systems he creates and the, the doctrines he creates. And that it, we, we all want to be relieved from fear and pain and stuff like that. So the devil's here offering a counterfeit to having God, and it's his system to do so. The devil wants to be a covering for all people. Ezekiel 28 verse 16 tells us, that the devil himself actually, before he sinned, you know, before the devil was the devil, as we know him today, he was a worship leader in heaven who clearly had free will. And he had this amazing position of standing in the presence of God. And he, the Bible says he was a covering cherub. It uses that language that he was the cherub that covers. Let me read to you. This is Ezekiel twenty-eight sixteen. God says, I will cast you as profane out of the mountain. There it is again of God. And I will destroy you. This is God speaking to the devil. O covering cherub from the midst of the stones of fire. So if the devil had the capacity to cover, he was in the presence and he would guard and protect the glory and the presence of God there. He had a ministry of covering. I believe there's a people who now get the privilege of taking his place in worship. That's what the devil was doing. And we now have the privilege of doing in worship to cover. Now, I believe that covering is first and foremost. It's our response to a loving God, and we just want to be in the presence. But this covering actually is extendable to people. It's extendable to your family. Come on. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. Acts 16. You and your house. You see, your faith is extendable. It can cover others. I believe we can cover our community through our, our response in worship. I believe we can cover our nation in response into worship. A worshiping people can bring a whole nation back under the blessing of God. Amen. Isaiah 30 and verse 1. Here's an indicator of that very principle. Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord, that take counsel 
but not of me. Now listen, and that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. You see, here's a reference to people who are taking counsel from some other source. This is a demonic audience. They're, they're listening to devils. They're taking counsel from another source, and it says here, and they are covering with a covering. So they're actually taking this counsel, and they're trying to extend it to others. You need to do this. You should be a part of that. They're preaching an anti-gospel, if the gospel is, in fact, that God alone is an adequate covering. They're offering a different gospel, a different covering. He says, they're, they're saying, they're offering a covering, but it's not of my spirit. Isaiah 30, verse 1, that they may add sin to sin. That walk to go down into Egypt and have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh. Now, this is an important point, And to trust in the shadow or under the covering of Egypt. You know, Egypt is a picture of the world. Egypt is a picture of sin. It's a picture of the systems of this world. And it clearly points to that demonic covering that's trying to cover the earth. Therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame and the trust in the shadow of Egypt your confusion. God is saying, listen, you got a choice here. Who's going to be your covering? If you choose Egypt and you choose the demonic kingdom, it will be your shame and your confusion in the end. I get it. It might feel nice initially. (laughs) This is the way the devil rolls. Come on. There's pleasure in sin. Help me, somebody. For a season. But the wages of sin, the end of sin, is death. Right? So the devil rolls this way. He actually puts out this little stimulus thing, and he says, here, just take this. I'll prove to you I can make you feel better. And he tries to bait us in. But he will not be able to cover us in the hour in which we're living. Only God can be that which we need. So the question becomes, when you talk about covering, trust. Because over and over here, the Lord says, in whom you are trusting, Egypt and Pharaoh, you're trusting. So really, to have a covering is really simplified by the idea of who are you trusting? Who are you trusting to be your provider? Who are you trusting to take you out of the heat of the day? It can only be the Lord. Let me just give you some quick references here. Ruth 2 and 12. Boaz saying to Ruth, The Lord recompense your work and a full reward be given you of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings, or that's the garment idea, you are come to trust. You see the the connection? Under the wing and trust trusting. Ruth had come to trust under the wings of the living God. Psalms 36 and verse 7. How excellent is your loving kindness, O God. Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. Here's the same principle. The wing is the place we place our trust under the covering of God. Psalm 61 and 4. I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of your wings. And here's one that is often quoted, Psalms 91 and verse 4. He shall cover you, God will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings shall you trust. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. You see, if you strip it all back, the real question is who are we looking to to be our covering? Who are we looking to, to be our provision, to be our safety, to be our guide, to be our protector? That question must be answered in this hour because there's two coverings, a God covering and a devil covering that have come to cover the earth. If you choose the devil's covering, I'm talking about place your trust in the systems that are being created in this world. And I'm not saying that our local governments and basic laws aren't sent by God in good. And we have to discern the difference here between good order and good governance and all that stuff. That's God-given and ordained by God. But we're talking about a larger scale agenda to bring all people. We're talking about a global movement to bring all people under the control of a demonic thing. So we'll close down here today with this thought. I don't want to give you too much to chew on lest you choke. (laughs) 
Jesus, as he often was, speaking to a mixed audience. He's telling a group of religious leaders and no doubt some others, there was a lot of mixture in those that would listen to him. He was saying, strive to enter in at the narrow gate because there's coming an hour when people are going to try to get in and they're not going to be able to. So don't just go through life saying, la, 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 que sera, sera, tomorrow I'll deal with that. No, Jesus is saying, while it is called today, while it is called today, harden not your hearts. And I tell you, there's a call from the Spirit of the Lord into the land today saying, awake, arise, your husband has come and he wants you to be his own. Strive to enter in through the narrow door for many will want to but won't be allowed. And then he says to those who will say, let us in, he'll say, I don't even know you. Now that's strong language from Jesus Christ. Those very thoughts in Luke's gospel chapter 13 give way to this. And people will come from the east and the west and from the north and the south and recline at table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. There is a great shift coming in the world, and what the world and religion have called important suddenly are going to become insignificant, and what the world has despised suddenly are going to be the most significant people on the planet. Not because they're something in and of themselves, but because of who they are under, whose covering they've chosen. He says this in verse 31, At that very hour some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. Now, it's not often Jesus speaks in the sense of political things or even talks about political figures. But here we have an account where Herod, who was a political figure of the day and a king, was wanting to kill him. According to the Pharisees, some would say that this was the Pharisees wanting to kill him, and they were simply trying to get him to leave their region. Either way, look at Jesus' response. He said to them, Go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. And then he goes into these such important words. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood, here's the term again, under her wings and you were not willing now i see jesus in this particular text representing the god the father because the bible says that in him in jesus all the fullness of the god had dwelled and here we have the husband longing for a people and he's having to tell that people in order for you to have the benefits that you're claiming you have in abraham You must see this thing for what it is. I'm sending help to you. Think of it. Jesus himself, God in the flesh, was standing in front of them. And they were trying to drive him out through a political agenda. Herod wants to kill you. (laughs) And Jesus pushes back. You know, Herod killed John. And Jesus is basically saying, listen, you might have taken John out, but there's going to be a prophetic voice in the land until my work is done. And I feel it today, all throughout this land and throughout the world, God is raising up prophetic voices speaking into the land. And they're able to say, go tell that fox, I'm not budging. I'm casting out devils, and I'm doing cures today. And when this thing is done, I will be fulfilled in the completion of it. Don't think I'm moving from my post. Amen. That's what the prophetic voice was coming out of Jesus And yet they were wanting to shut it down. Don't be surprised when your pursuit of God is met with resistance from another kingdom. By the way, if you're not being resisted, question how your walk is with God. Jesus said it this way. 
Woe unto you when all manner of men speak well of you. So they did of the false prophets. That's a pretty strong word. You know, we all want people to like us. If there's one thing we need to get delivered from, it's the need for people to like us. We will not be true to the call of God if we have to have everybody liking us. We'll compromise the truth. I'm asking God to help me personally. I'm asking God to help you and whosoever you may be listening. This is the hour. It's the greatest hour the earth has ever seen. It's a sober hour. And yet Jesus is saying, I want to gather you under my wing. God's provision was right there. Oh, Jerusalem, you who stoned the prophets, you kill those who are sent to help you. How often I would have gathered you under my covering, but you made a choice to say no. This morning, my cry, the cry of my heart, and I believe it's the cry of God's heart, is that we would once again not push away this gracious invitation to come under the shadow of his wing. If for some reason in your heart you find yourself trusting in Egypt, trusting in the systems, I'm not saying you don't use the systems of this world, but you don't trust the systems of this world. There is a difference. Did you hear what I just said? We're in this world, but we're not of this world. And we have to constantly distinguish the difference between being in and being of. We're here, but we're not of here. We're of Him, and we're in Him in that respect. So now, here's the decision. For those of you, maybe you're here today, and you've never, you know, if you're honest with yourself, that right now you feel very uncovered. Kind of like Adam and Eve in the beginning. Just like suddenly they were aware. I'm uncovered. You know, I believe the Spirit of God wants to help us see our condition as it is. That's why God said to Adam, where are you? Not because God lost track of him. God knew exactly where Adam was, He asked Adam, where are you? Because he wanted Adam to admit where he was. Maybe you're here today, and it's your day to admit where you are. God, I'm uncovered. God, I went astray. God, I went and I did my own thing. But today, God would say to you, if that's you, I love you just the same. And like I made a skin shed blood for Adam and Eve in the garden, So I have made a provision for you, and it's the shed blood of Jesus Christ. If that's you today, and you want to come to know him as your Lord and as your Savior, I want you right where you are, I don't care where you are, just to bow your head with me right now, and we're going to pray. If you're watching online, or if you're here in this parking lot. Simple prayer from the heart. Father, today I acknowledge my condition as one that is uncovered and in need of you. I know I'm exposed in so many places. Financially, I don't feel safe or secure. Emotionally, I'm all over the board. Every time I turn around, I'm up and I'm down. Oh God, I ask today that you forgive me for the choice I made. Even if it was under a deceptive voice from the devil, I nonetheless made it to come out from underneath your covering. And today, Father, I confess my sin and I return to you And like Ruth, I lay my life at your feet. And I say, oh God, would you spread your skirt over me today? Would you be my husband and my provider and my protector? God, I ask you for this. I give my life. No longer am I the the, the one in charge of my destiny, but I release the control of my life into your care. I thank you, Father, now for your great provision. And I receive it by faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Glory to God. If you just prayed that prayer, I would love to know that you did so. We would love to find ways to support you and follow up to encourage you in your faith. I'm telling you, the Bible says it's what's called being born again. And if you gave your heart to Jesus, now it's time to go live in the beauty of knowing Jesus. And it's an awesome thing to do. For everyone else that's here today or watching online that does not feel the need to make that initial confession, but you know in your heart of hearts you've been under a great struggle and you know there's a calling to step it up and to be that people that can worship and bring covering to those around you, I want to pray with you as well. Father, I thank you today 
that your spirit right now is searching throughout the earth, right here on this parking lot and all throughout the airwaves. Jesus, you're looking for those whose hearts are turned toward you. And God, today we come boldly asking you, Father, oh, would you spread your skirt again over us, God? We come to find refuge today in this very chaotic world and in this chaotic time in history. Let it be known that our hiding place is in you and under the shadow of your wing do we place our trust. God, I ask you to forgive us for the places where we've subtly shifted our trust over to the systems of this world and we've not fully allowed you to be our covering. Forgive us and wash us and bring us back into the security and safety of your cover of your wing. And I ask you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come on, give God some praise this morning. He's worthy of it all, as we sang this morning.